Right. Exactly. No, I mean, this is why you and I, this is where one of the upshots of theory, if they, you know, one in particular, especially for us Americans, is that it totally destroys the very presuppositions of libertarianism with, with that rugged individualism. You're not a pure individual. You First off, you're not thoroughly rational. You never can be because you have an unconscious. Uh, who you are as a, a person in society is completely mediated by your relations to others. This is why Heidegger devotes an entire chapter in Being in Time to being with and to Dosmon. There's a generic aspect to yourself, and if you don't have that generic act, uh, aspect, you might as well be a fucking alien. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be able to have any place in society at all. Uh, you have to be generic in order to be a human being. Um, not only that, any 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 identity that you want to occupy, that you want to work towards in society, say you want to become a teacher, well, you try being a teacher without students, right? What does that even mean? Like, this is what Heidegger showed, is that to be a, to be a baseball player requires other people, right? There's other players, there's opponents, there's teammates. To be a teacher requires students. To be a student requires having a, a, other teachers, right? So, this idea of just the pure, rational ego that libertarianism is built upon is a complete and utter fiction. Mm-hmm. It's broken ontology. And this is the thing that you get with a lot of the libertarian types, the pro-capitalist types. It's not a coincidence that they, they don't have strong ontological theories, right? Yeah. They just presuppose an ontological form, which is, oh, the, the rational ego, right? But they don't prove it, and you're not going to, right? This is what, whether we're talking about psychoanalysis, whether we're talking about existentialism, they all work together to undermine this myth of the singular ego that can function in a totally rational capacity. Well, they're all, they're all only slightly more sophisticated than a fucking Ayn Rand who's generally speaking everyone th- sees as pretty base not based um, but you know if you read her what is philosophy which I haven't read I haven't been subjected to too much of her crap but yeah. you know at, at the time when I was new to philosophy and, and it was her like it, I think it was like it's some essay about what is philosophy to her you know and I, and I did read it because I was reading her in a class and it was like her her epistemology is like you know her ex- explanation for what objectivism is it's like mm-hmm. you know you show up on a planet and you're trying to figure out if you can breathe the air like all of the forms of analysis that you're going to have to do are part of figuring out objectivity and philosophy is just figuring out what those things are like those how the, the forms for all of that for for, yeah. for having those clear thoughts which is also i mean fucking uh, you'd probably get the same thing from uh, Bertrand Russell, right? But she she takes that 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 fundamental egoism as a uh, as a, you know she takes it a little bit further with its capitalist insinuations as an individualist. But but the the thing that she does is the same thing that Heidegger does, which is she she's her point of departure is adults, not you know the, this whole like. Yeah, no, no. You're, you know, Heidegger's right that we're always already thrown into a world of others and language, and that we don't have our own language, and we don't choose our relationships, and all of this stuff, right? Like, so, so that's there with Heidegger, but, but there's no development. And this is something you always bring up when in our personal conversations, because I'm, you know, I've, I'm, I've got a lot. I, I know Heidegger a lot better than I know Lacan, and I like all of my existentialists, right? And you're like, yeah, but development. <laughs> development factors in and for me what that has become to mean oh sorry you're all muffled but what, what, what that's come to mean for me is just this idea of subject of subjectivity and subjectivization as they talk about it in the french why it's uh-huh. so important and why it's not the same thing or reducible to just an ego or an identity is that that the subjectivization of li- of the libidinal uh, forms of energy of, of of your desire of your interests of, of of all of these different things like they become you um, in in a way that's really fucking hard to break and so this is this is all in the background with my newest video essay and when um, one of the questions Brazilian physicists asked and this is too much to get into in this moment but just like the relation between that libidinal energy and time energy. I'll yeah. just say this that the the 
I'm constantly thinking that question. I can't, I can't not think that question whenever I read anybody talking about subjectivization or libidinal economy because it's always like it is related and exactly how it's related, it's not fully fleshed out. So, Well, yeah, but I mean that's what you're working towards. I mean that's right. what – it would the energy aspect, I mean it, it has to do with libido, right? It has to do with uh, that sort of thing and so – to take the time aspect, which of course the existentialists are focused on time, um, Lacan, you know, there's a there is a theory of time operative within his work. There's a new secondary source that just came out that attempts to break this down, but it's a very logical uh, theory of time. It's not our first person existential. Uh, I'm concerned with the world projecting myself forward onto the you know the projects I want to realize. It's not that kind of temporality. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, how have we talked about it before where uh, focusing on time energy is a way to, in a sense, marry Heidegger, Heidegger's work with Marx's work because energy has to do with labor power. But think about what D&G do in Anti-Oedipus. They, they connect labor power to libido, right? That's how they combine Marx and Freud. And... So there's already a way that the, the emphasis on energy from Marx on labor power connects. There's there's already like the groundwork's been laid with thinkers like Deleuze and Guattari, who connect that, and then and then they connected Nietzsche with will to power, right? So mm -hmm. the yeah. energy side connects these like this great uh, cluster of thinkers like Marx, Freud, Lacan, Deleuze and Guattari, uh, uh, and Nietzsche. And the time aspect connect Heidegger, Sartre, um, you could even say who's the rule, right? You could, you know, this whole um, this the, the, this whole existentialist tradition. So well, and why we don't have either one, why we don't have the two together, you know, in their beautiful original wholeness, you know, uh, that is a fundamentally a communal thing. It's a communal thing because other people have it to pool as well. The reason we don't have that you find in Marx because uh, with yeah. it, capitalism, uh, time energy is labor power, um, which means that we spend our lives trading away the future to pay rent basically. So, and then we never have time energy. So we're left with energy without time and time without energy. Um, so the, you know, yeah, this is, this is something I'm thinking a lot about because that subjectivization, um, is, is a really big deal. And for me, you might've have, might've have noticed if you've seen those essays or ever heard me talk about it in passing, I usually throw attention in there as a sort of after effect. I'm like time, energy, and attention, <laughs> time, energy, and attention. I always say that, but why do I say that? And it's like, I haven't really sat and like worked this out rigorously because I'm still like, you know, it's, 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 it's a work in progress, obviously. But the attention, t attention is necessary um, to be able to give attention. You have to have attention. You have to have the potential for attention to be able to give someone else attention, right? If you don't have the, the, the time energy to give attention to someone else, then how are you going to get to know them over time and then give them recognition? And so, um, and, and, and so you need to be able to give other people recognition and you need to be able to win recognition from others. But right now, the only kinds of recognition you get are superficial forms of, re of, of recognition either online or super institutionalized forms of recognition like, oh, you ran for office or you, you know, you, you, you know, you got this, this raise or you promoted in a business, you started, you know, a big company that was successful, whatever. Those are institutionalized forms of recognition, but you know, the, the kind of like if you were in a community where you knew everybody, like there's 150 of you and that's society for you, um, then you know what, get, what gets recognition in that context. You know what can get you. There are avenues towards the fulfillment of recognition and you have the time energy to give other people recognition over time as well. Because recognition is not something that can be given, oh, I affirm your identity, now we're done. No, recognition in the in the sense that we're using it, you and I, um, is is going to mean like it, it requires sustained effort of of committing yourself to to getting to know that other, or at least or at least it could be, for instance, maybe I don't know you from from anybody else, you know, I I I don't, I don't know you at all, but because I've studied philosophy now for a long time, and then I hear you talk about philosophy because I've studied philosophy long enough, putting in that sustained effort, I'm able to like you're saying things where I'm like. Oh, I'm cluing into you know more about this than me. Oh, now you get my recognition there. 
And that's not something that I, there are people with doctorates. I wouldn't give them that uh, that that recognition. <laughs> uh, but you know, think about what you just said, though. Right? This is yeah. this all plays into the dynamic between the ideal ego and the ego ideal, right? What you're saying for me as an or or let's just say the ego, right? For me. Uh, you know, to get uh, recognized by others, right? To have my identity confirmed and validated requires that I'm playing by the rules of the ego ideal operative in my society. There's there's certain sets of values that we all share, and if you don't share those, you're not going to get recognition. And because of that, it, it's going to lead. You know, if you're not recognized by your your peers, your uh, the others around you. That's going to lead to all kinds of issues, right? And this is what the infant is working, is constantly dealing with, is if I don't please the other, if I don't please my parent or my primary caregiver, this is going to be bad for me, so I have to be the way the other wants me to be in order to sustain my very life, right? I had to, in order for me to have any sort of comfort or pleasure, I have to be what the other desires. And, you know, so there, there's these different aspects, right? There's right. the parent as an imaginary other, which, the, of course, the parent has their own specific set of identifications they've made. There's images they identify with. That they go, oh, that's me, right? But there's also the other aspect of the other, which is their symbolic values, their symbolic aspect, which these are the principles, values, rules, standards, norms that I live by and that I accept as a participant in my society, in my symbolic order. And then there's the real missing part, which is the real aspect of the other, which is the other's desire. You can never be sure when it comes to the, what the other desires. The other can tell you what they want. They can make a demand on you, but you're never absolutely sure that's what they want. Why? Because that, because your parent has an unconscious too. They're not completely unified within themselves. They're a split subject. They're a divided subject between ego slash consciousness and their sub their unconscious subjectivity, right? And so, the desire of the other is this very menacing thing because even if the other tells you what they want from you, you never can fully rely on it. There's always an opacity, always a mystery to the desire of the other, and. That is what the child, that's kind of the, the aspect of the other. We'll come to see, this is what Heidegger calls the thing, das Ding in German. <clears throat> and it's that, that, that unknowability in the other, right? It, it's close to what Levinas was talking about with, with the otherness of the other, the alterity of the other, right? Where no matter what, how many concepts you have, uh, you can never master the other. The other has this infinite dimension. Well, this is Lacan's way of thinking about it. It's to talk about the desire of the other or Das Ding, the thing, right? Um, so so I yeah. Put da, so I've got Das Ding. I've put it in the real cat in the re, in the real oh, register. Right. Yep. Uh, we've got we've got uh, we've got okay. So we got the real. Uh, for, and there's going to be folks who don't have eyes on the whiteboard. None of this is actually essential, but just understand that it's a sort of Venn diagram where you've got the three circles. It's real, symbolic, and imaginary. That's the three circles. And I've put in the imaginary one the mirror stage, which is that whole process of becoming vis-a-vis -vis the primary caregiver and the, and whoever else is in the world in your life at the time that you're coming which to consciousness. Great. You recognize yourself through a fundamental misrecognition. Right. You're not that imago. And that fundamental misrecognition, the product of it is that ego. Um, and that ego, it, it divides into the ideal ego, which is still in the realm of the imaginary. But then the other part is the ego ideal, which is kind of in that piece between the symbolic and the imaginary. Now we move over into the, the register of the symbolic. That's where the norms, the rules, the laws, the language. Um, yes. And, and that stuff is the conscious stuff, right? And then we got the unconscious stuff that runs counter to that that includes desire, uh, COVID-19, class war. Um, what was an, oh, and Das Ding. And so here's the thing I would say, right? We have to pay close attention to how these, these orders inter, interlock, right? That's the whole thing. This is not a straight up Venn diagram. It's a Borromean knot, which is to say, if you look at it, like if you, if you Google Borromean knot, you'll see that these three circles are actually interlocked. It's not like you can separate them. They're all linked together like a chain. 
And if you were to break that, you would break apart the psyche. I mean, that's another way to talk about it. It, it. Again, it sounds too much like ego psychology, but those three registers, you could say, make up the psyche, put it in quotes, uh, the, the, the human psyche. And so, yeah, the, those are the three primary registers. Let me see what we have. While you look at that, though, we've got the kid who wants the trophy, um, and that's the ideal ego is the one who could get the trophy, and that's what you're fixated on in the in the you know when you're when you're a kid and you're like I want to be this I want to be that I want and maybe you're like fuck dad I I want to I want to have whatever music on my wall dad would hate right like but whatever it is you're kind of building your ideal um, ego um, but there's part of it like you basically want to win someone's respect you want to win someone's recognition maybe there's no one person but it's a general sense of there is respect out there that I could gain. Um, and so this is your ideal, your ego ideal, but, but the ego ideal, um, has rules for recognition and you're trying to learn what those rules are. And maybe you're trying to learn what those rules are by breaking some of those rules. Um, yep. and then I, but I've, in returning the dick, I accidentally, and this was a fortuitous occasion, put the penis on the word recognition. The, the, the head of that ginormous phallus is resting on, on, on the R for recognition, which I then I, I then put an arrow. I say not real. That penis is not real. But the phallus, Symbolic. the phallus, it, it basically the phallus is that that force of, of of recognition and power. The power that has recognition. The power that can give recognition. Am I right? Okay. So one of the most difficult concepts is the phallus. It, it's it, when you get into Lacanian psychoanalysis, it, this will drive you crazy because. For Freud, the phallus was just the penis, right? It was the literal organ. But just like Lacan takes the category of the mother, the category of the father, and functionalizes them, the phallus now becomes a, quote, signifier, which is to say it has something to do with language, with symbolic uh, rules, practices, norms, uh, and it's not limited to an actual biological organ. And so, what the phallus essentially, again, we're getting a, kind, a little bit ahead of ourselves because it really has to do with the Oedipus complex and then okay. with sexuality. But, and I hate it. I hate when Lacanians just go, well, the phallus is the signifier or it's a signifier. It's, it's so unhelpful. Yeah. But <laughs> I just want to touch on a few other things before we circle back to this. To that, we'll, yeah. Yeah, we'll get back to this. So, just to close out our discussion of the imaginary before we flesh out the symbolic a little more, and then we'll get to the real. Okay, so the other thing that we want to talk about that is, you could say that it's a, it would belong in the imaginary and the symbolic. Um, it's the unary trait. And the unary trait, Lacan seems to use it in different contexts for different purposes, but this concept essentially goes back to Freud's work on group psychology. And so Freud's idea is that when it comes to group cohesion, usually a group is centered around a leader. And the group identifies with some trait in the leader. And this trait it really helps us understand how ideology works, how group psychology works. And so the funny thing is, what's interesting when you look at like the empirical research of this, when we identify with a leader, we usually don't identify with some lofty norm, some lofty ideals of them, some uh, venerable characteristic, right? We usually identify with some imperfection, some obscene aspect of them, some, some grotesque or uh, unprofessional dimension, right? So the most obvious example of this for us is Trump. Everybody, liberals will sit around and get all mad. And they'll go, how can how can people at all identify with this guy? How can he be who they base their group cohesion around? And what liberals miss is that it's precisely his obscenity, his vulgarity, that people identify with. It's him being rude to the liberals. It's him owning the libtards, right? It's that whole thing, uh, you know, making fun of the, the disabled journalists, right? That's what they identify with. And it's interesting to find that, right? Because when you look at 
group identity, group cohesion, we, t we just spontaneously tend to look for some great aspect in the leader. And when we, can't, when we don't see that, we're sitting there going, it, it becomes this huge mystery. But the reason we identify with this obscene aspect, this rude aspect, this uh, ugly, immoral, grotesque dimension is it signifies to us that this leader has the enjoyment that we all wish we had, right? This person can get away with this due to their symbolic power, right? Their potency, their uh, effectivity in the social order. And so the very fact that they can get away with doing something that seems transgressive is precisely why we identify with them. And so we of Freud, Lacan calls this the unary trait. Uh, it, it, if you want to put it up there, it's U in This is a, a new one to me, actually. Yeah. So U in A R Y trait. And I would, I, looking at, I would put it between the imaginary and the symbolic, because it's oh, oh, slow down, slow down. So I'm, I'm very slow. So, unary is there a Y at the end of that? Yeah, it's U N A R Y trait. T R A I T. And you would put it between the symbolic and the what? I put it between the imaginary and the symbolic, and the reason is because, on the one hand. This trait is something I identify with. I either aspire to it or I, I like it. I, I, I feel like it somehow embodies me or it's speaking for me. Um, or, but, but, but on the other hand, it also serves as a signifier that anchors you to other people, right? It's, what, it's a signifier, a mark that you all share in common. And so it serves to have, to, 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 it's almost, you can also think of it as a master signifier, I guess. It's that signifier that holds a group together, right? And so Trump supporters, I also think it's a mistake. Freud really puts the emphasis on it being singular, but I think there are clusters of unary traits. I think, for example, like with the Trump supporters, not all of them identify with him just because he's vulgar. A lot of them do. But other ones would say, oh, it's the Make America Great Again thing, which is to say, I identify with his, his sense of nostalgia, right? There, but there's a limited number of these unary traits, right? And, I mean, it would be interesting if you could say, all right, well, these are three unary traits that the various Trump supporters uh, have. It would be more interesting to be go, okay, can we, re can we find one behind these three? But this is one way of using semiotics or the analysis of language, right, to understand how certain signifiers hold various ideological spaces together, give them cohesion, right? This is one of the big problems with the left, right? We are all so fragmented on the left. We have Marxists, you have anarchists, you have social democrats, you have, like, liberal leftists. You have all these, and we can't get a signifier that unifies all of us, right? We spend so much time critiquing each other, we never can get on the same page. And it's not to say that there aren't substantial differences between these various isms, right? Of course there there is, but it's almost like we're all dying for the left to finally unify right now. And the question of what kind of unary trait, what kind of master signifier could unify all of us is something that I think we should all be thinking about. We interrupt this conversation for a quick message from our sponsors. You may recognize this conversation from the past because it is actually a piece of a longer live stream. So what I've done is I've edited the conversations I had with Mikey down into smaller chunks and I will be releasing those serially until the launch of the Slavoj Zizek's For They Know Not What They Do course taught by Michael Downs and myself. I will be asking him the questions and hystericizing him along with a cohort of people who will be joining us live and in the forums as we do a close reading of what Slavoj Zizek claims is his most important theoretical work, more important than sublime objective ideology by far. He said that if you don't have anything to say about for they know not what they do, then keep silent when it comes to sublime objective ideology. But we don't just do close 
thorough hardcore readings we also have some more introductory stuff and so if you go to theory hyphen underground.com forward slash events then you'll be able to see the dates of all of the upcoming events you see that the idea of the university taught by myself brian and and a couple of educators who are very close to me and uh, we wanted to focus on carl jasper's short work the idea of university as a way to start the year but it's also a way for theory underground to get off on the right track the january 25th is the professional managerial class consciousness course that i'm co-teaching with Elton LK of the Working Class Intelligentsia podcast. And then in February, on the 25th of February, launches GJX4, They Know Not What They Do. Mikey has spent two decades getting himself to the point where he feels confident enough to teach this book. And I think that that humility and effort that he's put in is something that we can all learn from. I mean, come on. He's like our own homegrown Zizek. He's like our own like national treasure i think that we really ought to uplift him and give credit where it's due not just take him for granted and act like you know we don't need to so that's a part of the reason actually why i really appreciate brian becker from singularity as sublimity podcast and he's done a lot of amazing teaching work himself a lot of people read the blog and then don't give credit where it's due and that would be fine if he had a cushy academic career with tenure and all that but he doesn't he's working in a warehouse supporting his mom we need to hashtag free Mikey from wage labor so that he can spend more time doing what his passion is, which is teaching philosophy and theory, writing books. That's what we want. More of these kinds of conversations. Make it possible. Make a donation. 5, 15, 20, 50, 100. Make the donation today. Please. It means a lot. Words are cheap. Money? Now that's where it matters. Get your skin in the game. Show Mikey you care. I hope that we'll get to do a lot more of this in the near future. And then the last thing, I'm doing a countrywide tour this year. I will be on the East Coast, I will be on the West Coast, and I will be everywhere in between. So if you want me to come to your town or city, email me, it's down below. If you want to volunteer, be a part of the street team, host or guide while we're there, let me know. I hope to be in a city near you sometime this year. And I hope that you'll take one of my classes. Thanks.